Disclaimer, if you're wondering why your favorite film isn't on this list, it's because I'm just one guy and I can't see everything every year. These are some that would be on here had I been able to see them or if I had more time. They will either get covered in next year's list or I'll update this list in the comments somewhere down the line if I feel they belong in the top 10. Also, some of these technically count as 2021 films because most people won't get to see them until then, but I kind of just went by when I got to see them because I got pressed to certain festivals and I got lucky and rented virtual tickets and uh, yeah. What's up lads, it's me, K Father, and uh oh, looks like 2020 is almost over. Why? I know it sucks because this was shaping up to be such a great year, right? Kidding, this was a terrible year, but we did have some good movies out of it. So many good movies that similar to last year, I'll be doing a top 20. Didn't get to see nearly as many movies this year as I have been able to in the past, but I did my best and let's start. Coming in at number 20 is Wolfwalkers, directed by Tom Moore and Ross Stewart. 19 goes to Shit House, directed by Cooper Rafe. Number 18 is Red, White, and Blue, directed by Steve McQueen. Number 17 is She Dies Tomorrow, directed by Amy Simetz. And at 16, we have Palm Springs, directed by Max Barbacow. Coming in at number 15 is Mangrove, directed by Steve McQueen, a comprehensive and timeless retelling of racial injustice that was and still is happening across the world. At number 14, it's Bad Education, directed by Corey Finley, a sharp Sharp, hilarious, and entertaining film with a great Hugh Jackman performance. At number 13, we have Time, directed by Garrett Bradley, the most emotionally gripping documentary of the year set to a beautiful piano score. Coming in at number 12 is First Cow, directed by Kelly Reichardt, a film about friendship and so much more, told through a crisp, patient Kelly Reichardt lens. And at number 11, we have Feels Good Man, directed by Arthur Jones, my favorite documentary of the year and one that I'm sure will only become more relevant with time. Give it up for the movies that didn't make the top 10! Alright, let's get into it. Sound of Metal was without a doubt the hardest film for me to get through this year. The sound design immediately puts you in the shoes of our main character, a heavy metal drummer who slowly comes to terms with becoming deaf. If that wasn't enough to sell you, this makes for an honestly eye-opening and painful experience, which is so crucial to understanding the frustration and temper he undergoes throughout. Riz Ahmed, Olivia Cook, and frickin' Paul Racy all deliver award-worthy performances that left me in awe. Lee Isaac Chung's Minari is one of the most human films of the year as it tells the story of a Korean family assimilating into American culture. It is easily one of the most clever ways I've seen America depicted on the screen as it touches on every corner from religion to familial roles to whatever the American dream is. It works almost like a collection of vignettes where if you were to take out any scene, it would work as its own short film. The score from Emil Massetti is heavenly, and I mean heavenly. The cinematography is equally as dreamy, putting me in this wondrous lens of the children, but also the foggy lens of these parents. If I had to describe it in one sentence, it's one of the most beautiful movies I saw this year. As far as comedies go, this is probably the best I saw this year, although I wouldn't categorize this entirely as a comedy. It has some terrific dramatic elements going for it, and it made me feel uh, pretty anxious. Technically, this counts as a horror thriller. Emma Seligman has a fresh voice that I cannot wait to see more of. Rachel Sinat does so much with this performance. I also can't wait to see more of her. It is really just such a sharp film with a bisexual energy to it that I'm totally obsessed with and can't wait to watch again. Pixar is officially back with Soul, and I'm not just saying they're back for the sake of convincing myself, I've had plenty of that in the last few years, I mean like they're back. Soul is so imaginative and personal, the visuals are unlike anything I've seen before, but they don't come across as though they're doing it for the sake of being original, they just work. The story is so classic Pixar in its ambition and originality and charm, but it also feels like new territory for them, in that it attempts to reach a level of maturity that we haven't seen them explore yet. Joe Gardner is one of Pete Docter's best protagonists, capturing so much unique giftedness while still being incredibly grounded and relatable. Depression, anxiety, and their link to purpose is something that I do think should be explored more in films made for kids, and Soul just nailed it. It kind of leaves you with the message of, hey, your purpose isn't your passion, and it doesn't have to be your success. It just has to be living and being here. And that's something kids just don't hear enough of. This is one of the most heartfelt films of the year, and I'm very glad it exists. This year, Steve McQueen made five films as part of his Small Axe Anthology series, each based on real-life experiences of London's West Indian community between 1969 and 1982. This series in itself is a beast to experience, and I cannot recommend its entirety enough, but Lover's Rock, the second film in the series, is close to being a masterpiece in sensual cinema. It pretty much all takes place at one party, and the story is kind of just 
what happens that night. There's no event that throws you into another event. There's no arc and the structure is as loose as it gets. It's something that honestly runs entirely on atmosphere. A really good one at that. I can smell the smoke in the air and I can hear the vibrations of the bass within my body when I watch this, which is all essential to capturing the love that comes out of that in this room. At one point they play the same song five different times and it works. It's hypnotic and to write about something like that feels utterly pointless. So I'm just gonna say check it out, especially if you miss parties like I do. I loved Another Round. A predictable, relatively easy watch? Sure, but is there much wrong with that? I really love the fact that Thomas Vinterberg was able to take a subject as complex and as dark as alcoholism and turn it into something both introspective and fun. Like it fully embraces the fact that yes, being drunk is a great time and it is very fun and it's that way of almost seducing you that leads to the darkness that the film later gets into. It examines which relationships this affects, not only the obvious ones like family and friends friends, but also others you wouldn't expect. I can't talk about this without mentioning Mad Mickelson's performance, which is so good. The dance that he does near the end is specifically so freeing and expressive, I know everything about his character in that scene. It almost made me cry. As a whole, this is just a really good movie that gets it. With Charlie Kaufman, you sort of have an expectation going into his work. You know you're getting something dense. To some, it's extremely pretentious and self-indulgent and just plain annoying. And to others, people like myself, it's not only extremely personal, but it's kind of a lot of fun. With I'm Thinking of Ending Things, Kaufman delivered the most Charlie Kaufman thing he's ever done while simultaneously delivering something nobody saw coming besides the people that read the book. But I'd argue that even then, Ending Things is a wildly original film both in its structure and form, and I think that's a huge feat for someone like Kaufman. There were definitely easier and more satisfying ways he could have gone about telling this story, and he chose instead to lean into his usual style. With very odd editing choices and filming scenes in a way that's so irritating and loaded with pieces to this puzzle that you can't help but feel dizzy by the end. From my view, he's one of the only filmmakers working today that's bold enough to take these existentialist philosophical arguments and present them through filmmaking, and he's doing it in his own original lens. Which is to say, this thing is having a lot more fun than I think people are giving it credit for. And all of that is something I'm so attracted to and won't ever not appreciate. Love it or hate it, all I'm saying is I'm thinking of ending things may just be the most ambitious film of the year. Eliza Hittman's Never Rarely Sometimes Always isn't by any means the loudest or most complex film of the year. In fact, it may just be the opposite of I'm Thinking of Ending Things. It tells the story of a young woman who travels to New York City with her friend after an unintended pregnancy. Films about pregnancy always, for whatever reason, strike a chord with me because they feel more emotionally vulnerable than most of what I see. And this film specifically did so in the most effective way. Because sure, this examines how abortion, women's rights, and women in general are treated in a modern modern American society, but it also does so much with Autumn specifically as a character. Empathy is created through some incredibly subtle yet effective cinematography and sound design. The performances are so real, I find it hard to believe that any of this was acting. I guess it's just so rare that I catch something so authentically American, and this was exactly that. If the one shot about halfway through this doesn't tear your heart into a million little pieces, I don't know what will. Nomadland was the film I dreaded writing about the most this year, and I mean that as high praise, because it's one thing to talk about and describe the transcendent filmmaking on display here and to retell why Fern and her story is so significant to now. It's one thing to talk about Frances McDormand's career best performance or the gorgeous cinematography, but there's really no way I can put into words why this movie works so well. I think this year specifically it's felt like my eyes have squinted through most days. By that I mean undergoing the sense of isolation and relearning what the word essential means has been beneficial in a lot of ways, but it's also become unarguably narrowing for my mindset. There's a greater fear of losing someone close to you when those words close to you take on a much more literal meaning. Possessions and love we surround ourselves with are themes we take for granted in our own lives, and they're themes Nomadland isn't afraid to focus on. I think I get especially emotional talking about Nomadland because by the end of this movie, 
I felt as though for the first time in months my eyes were not squinting, and they were a bit wider than they've been. There was a newfound sense of appreciation for what around me I wanted and what I needed and what will always be there. It's an eye-opening film that moves you past its runtime, and I'm, <laughs> I'm experiencing that right now as I'm recording this. So similar to the ground I'll walk on the next time I step outside, I know no matter how much I lose around me, at least this will stay. A year ago in 2019, I had a very tough time putting together my list because it was a rare year where I obsessed over a lot of movies. Parasite, Climax, Marriage Story, come on. In 2020, we had a lot of fantastic films that neared perfection and brought so many new ideas and stories to the table, but there was only one film I truly obsessed over and it was Miranda July's Kajillionaire. Kajillionaire was the only film that I couldn't stop thinking about, the only film with an atmosphere so original and rich with detail that I never wanted to leave it, the only film that really scratched an itch I didn't know needed to be scratched, one that captured the feeling of being alone, and more importantly, the desire to be loved that comes with it. With every scene in this movie, no matter which one we're talking about, there's a sense of quirky humor that you can only get from July's work, but there's a deep sadness that you also can't ignore. One that forces you to almost re-examine your own relationships and priorities. I'm fine, or at least I'm as fine as I can be after such a traumatizing year, but this movie really messed me up and had me, similar to old Dolio, trying to learn how to be a person all over again. Because what a lot of people don't realize is learning how to be your own person, not just someone's child or someone's parent or someone's partner, but instead just you, that's a difficult and frustrating process that this movie completely understands. July's filmmaking is more original than anything I saw this year. The cinematography gives space for the characters to deliver the incredibly expressive performances that they give. The score by, again, Emile Mossetti has such a unique sound that mixes determination, loneliness, and optimism all into one piece. And above all, it is a ridiculously entertaining film that nails its heist elements. May I remind you, this is a heist film, technically. And while this may be pretty divisive and unlikable for a lot of people, there's no doubt in my mind that as more people see this movie, as more people pick up on that parent-child relationship that this movie is actually about, it'll no doubt go down as a lot of people's favorite movie just for its entertainment, its originality, and its empathy. All things that I personally definitely needed after a year like this. And that's my top 20 of 2020. Thank you guys so much for a great year. This was a really crazy year for the channel, and I sincerely appreciate all the support. And with all this said, thanks for watching. Check out all these films and form your own opinions. Check out my podcast, and I'll see you guys in the next year.